And the final talk in the session will be given by Brandon Wu from Harvard University. Can you all hear me from the back all right? Perfect. All right, first, um, huge thanks to the organizers. It's been a super fun conference. Uh, today, I'm excited to be sharing research that I've been doing with Mia Taylor, Adrian Tseng, Song Hee Song, and Liz Spelke on toddlers' understanding of others' experiences. When we interact with other people, we often need to keep track of each other's different perspectives and experiences. For instance, when we're seated across from each other, one's left might be the other's right, what's upright to one would instead be inverted or upside down to the other. Now this notion that two people um, can have different experiences, different perspectives, stands at the core of a lot of human communication and pedagogy. Today I'll be presenting experiments that my collaborators and I have been doing on um, toddlers and whether they understand others' distinctive perceptual experiences, as well as what the role of language may be in supporting that understanding. Now, I, I'll be upfront, I'm coming at this work um, as someone whose background is in doing research on mental state reasoning, and so I'm especially excited to be sharing this work with uh, folks in the audience who have more expertise in language development. Now, a large body of work, um, including work um, done by people here, and including work that fortunately was reviewed already by Vicky and by Rosie, um, has provided evidence that infants and toddlers are sensitive to others' perceptual access, that is, whether others can see um, an object or an event. This includes whether an object is visible or occluded to someone else, as well as whether someone is present versus absent to observe an event occur. Now, these findings I find striking. Infants and toddlers, they themselves get to see everything happen in these studies. Nevertheless, they appreciate that others might not, that others' view might be blocked by barriers, um, that others might be absent to observe an event occur. Now, after I, um, in my past work, found evidence consistent with this understanding of perceptual access, I started wondering about a different but related challenge to mental state reasoning. And that's this idea that two people can look at the same thing for the first time, have equal perceptual access to that object or picture, and experience it differently. For instance, uh, take this picture of a turtle on the floor here. It looks upright to you and me, but to someone facing us, like this red circle here, it would instead be inverted, upside down. Or take this picture, it's a rabbit-duck illusion. It looks like a rabbit right now, but to someone whose perspective differs from ours, it could look as a duck. All right. Um, so. I use this rabbit duck image for the experiments that I'll be presenting today. And for the purpose of today's presentation, I'll be referring to how pictures like these look to different individuals as an individual's distinctive experience of that picture. Now, this kind of reasoning has been explored in depth in older children and in adults. Because there's evidence, though, of an early understanding of others' perceptual access, I wanted to design a task suitable um, for younger toddlers. Now, all the experiments that I'm presenting today were pre-registered on the open science framework, and I studied 14 to 15-month-old toddlers who've demonstrated capacities to understand others' perceptual access in past work. Now, in familiarization, we've got an actor here seated in front of two rabbit duck images, and I'm hoping the contrast is okay for y'all. Um, the image that appears as a duck to the actor instead is um, in a rabbit orientation for the toddler and vice versa for the other image there. Now the actor here, he repeatedly reaches for pictures in a particular orientation for himself. Um, here he's reaching for what appears as a rabbit to him, but as a duck to the toddler. And the labels that I've got here indicate how each picture looks to the actor. All right, so the question here is whether toddlers are encoding the actor's goal from his perspective um, or instead from their own perspective. At test, what happens is the actor moves to the near side of the room. 
Now his perspective is aligned with that of the toddlers. And he sees again a picture um, of the image in a duck and in a rabbit orientation. And the question is, will toddlers expect the actor to reach for pictures that are of the same orientation to um, himself, so still a rabbit, um, relative to familiarization, or instead, um, now for a picture that's of the same orientation to the toddler, still a duck. And we are um, labeling the trials here to reflect whose perspective the action was consistent with relative to the earlier familiarization phase. Now we probed how long the toddlers looked at these different events, a measure of surprise, a violation of expectation paradigm. And so here we are testing then for an understanding of others' distinctive experiences embedded within a goal attribution paradigm building off of work by Amanda Woodward and colleagues. Now before showing you the data, I want to orient you to the graph. On the x-axis, we've got the trial type of test, whether the actor was acting consistently from his perspective versus the toddlers. The y-axis is looking time with longer looking taken as a measure, um, to, as an indicator of surprise. And this here is a box plot. The diamonds represent means. Lines connect data coming from individual toddlers. And the beta here is a measure of standardized effect size. Now we see here then that toddlers looked longer when the actor acted consistently from his own perspective, suggestive that they found that surprising. They did not then um, demonstrate sensitivity to the actor's distinctive perceptual experience of the pictures and familiarization here. Now, seeing this, we sought to attempt to replicate this, as well as to address two outstanding questions we had. First, did toddlers realize how these images looked upon rotation? Second, did toddlers recognize these images even as a rabbit, as a duck? The answer to these questions um, could bear on our interpretation of what's happening in experiment one, why toddlers might be struggling. Now, to address these questions, we implemented three changes. First, we included a pre-familiarization uh, video of each of these pictures rotating so that the toddlers experience the picture changing from rabbit to duck orientation, reducing any challenge of mental rotation associated with this task. We next uh, further included a word recognition test. Do the toddlers recognize the words duck and child-friendly word bunny? Um, do they map on those words to the picture um, in the different orientations here? We further surveyed caregivers about their toddler's exposure to and knowledge of these words. Now here's how the word recognition phase looked. And this here depicts what the child saw. Our right is um, going to be on the child's right. And so when she raises this hand here, it's her right hand. So here she is pointing to the bunny, and then she does this. And I thought that would be cuter than the data. Um, so here are the data consistent with that, but not all of them did this. OK. So the idea is that when, um, or the finding here is that when children hear the word bunny here, they are more likely to look at the bunny orientation there um, relative to when they hear the word duck. So they're looking differently depending on the word they hear there. And you'll notice that the sample size is larger. And the reason for this is that we really wanted to make sure that we had at least 24 participants here whose caregivers were certain, were confident that their toddlers understood either the words duck or bunny. All right, now the third change that we included here um, is that the actor didn't just reach for pictures, he rotated them, um, demonstrating that he has a goal of making pictures look um, in a certain way for himself. Here he's rotating pictures from a rabbit orientation to a duck orientation. We thought that this effect on contact might emphasize um, the actor's perspective and also provide children with further evidence that pictures look different upon rotation. Now the question is whether toddlers would expect the actor when he moves to the near side of the room at test to rotate pictures of the same initial orientation to him or instead to the toddler. And we see that despite the three changes we've made here, toddlers again um, don't expect the actor to behave consistently from his perspective. They look longer when that happens, suggestive they find that surprising. 
All right. Now, I've documented these findings in the first two experiments, along with other conceptual replications in a preprint. Across all the experiments I'd done, um, toddlers did not implicitly reason about the actor's um, distinctive perceptual experience. Here, though, we recognize that the actor never um, really spoke about the pictures. Um, he remained silent throughout. But we often use language to convey our distinctive experiences. This is my left, for example. Would toddlers maybe perform better at our task if the actor spoke conveying his experience? Um, and this is work that Liz Spelke and I started doing with our students, Mia Taylor, Adrian Tseng, and Song Hee Song. Now, there is a large body of evidence suggestive that language supports infants and toddlers' understanding of object kinds. And I wanted to highlight a few key studies that have inspired um, this next experiment that I'll show you. In one study by Booth and Waxman, 14-month-olds uh, were presented with a novel object, and for different children, they heard it described in different ways. For some, this was described using an adjective. This one is blickish. For others, this was described using a noun. This one is a blicket. And adjectives and nouns, they're content words. They communicate semantic content, something specific about an object. Um, other children still um, instead heard this only described using pronouns. Look at this one here. And the finding here is that the kind of language that toddlers heard here impacted the inferences that they made. When toddlers heard this described using an adjective, they focused on the color, a property of the object. When they heard the object described using a noun, they focused on the object shape. And when they heard instead a pronoun, they formed neither of those inferences. Now, Duar and Shu, um, in other uh, related work um, presented nine-month-old infants with an opaque box, and an actor um, observed, um, looked into this box, and different children heard the actor say different things. Some heard the actor say the same noun twice, I see a thep, I see a thep. Others heard the, um, the actor say different nouns, I see a dax, I see a wug, and again, um, Toddlers form different, I'm sorry, infants form different inferences here depending on what they heard. Uh, when they heard just one noun twice, they inferred there was just one kind of object inside. When they heard different nouns, they inferred there were two different kinds of objects. And we sought to then integrate um, this with the work we were doing and see whether using language in these ways might support toddlers' understanding of others' experiences. We had two conditions. I'll go over the experimental condition first. We're using the rabbit duck image again. Um, and in familiarization, we've got the actor seated on the near side of the room in front of two rabbit duck images. He looks at and labels the two pictures. Sorry, I'm realizing audio might not be working. Um, but it's right there. <laughs> and so from work by Fei Xu and colleagues, toddlers, um, are expected to infer that these images and their different orientations represent different kinds of objects. And our goal here is to establish that the experiences um, of the actor differ depending on their orientation. And we show the actor doing this again and again, regardless of the side of the picture here. At test, the actor moves to the near, uh, sorry, to the, a different side of the room, here the right side. And the question is whether toddlers will expect him to continue reaching for what appears to be the same um, to him or instead to the toddler. Um, and you'll notice there's no speech here. Um, I wanted to um, explain we have the actor moving from an, the near side of the room to a different side of the room here rather than the opposite so that they can't just match what the actor had said in familiarization to what he'll do at test um, th to succeed. They'll need to account for the change in his perspective. Now, our control condition is superficially similar here. The actor, though, is looking at and saying, um, pr using pronouns. And so, based on work by Sandra Waxman's group, by Fei Xu's group, this shouldn't support inferences that these um, pictures and their different orientations represent different kinds. The rest of the procedure is the same as our experimental condition, and again, there was no language here. And so what do we find? 
In our controlled condition, we see no significant difference. It's um, qualitatively in the same direction as what I'd shown you. Uh, we have longer looking when the actor behaves consistently from his perspective. Um, although it's not significant, I wouldn't take this as a failed replication because there is language. It might be engaging the toddlers in this um, condition more. The question, the key question here is, in our experimental condition, when the actor communicates his experience of the pictures, what happens? And for the first time, we are seeing the reverse pattern of findings here. Toddlers are looking longer when the actor reaches consistently from the toddler's perspective, suggestive that they now find that surprising. They're demonstrating sensitivity to the actor's experience. Taken together with the earlier experiments, this suggests that, the un that, that understanding others' distinctive experiences may present a challenge to toddlers, but that informative language may help to enable them to overcome those challenges. Um, here, language is communicating that the actor experiences the pictures differently depending on their orientation, um, highlighting the importance of the orientation of a picture for the actor's actions. Uh, this is but a tentative conclusion. It's just one experiment demonstrating this effect so far, and we dearly need to conceptually replicate these findings. A lot of work, I think, um, can be done to explore whether and how language may support toddlers' understanding of others' experiences as well as others' minds more broadly. And so at this time, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, the research team, uh, and participants and families for their support. Thank you. Okay, we have a bit of time for questions, and I see one there kind of in the middle between, yes, and another one here after. Thank you, Brandon. A, a clarification question. In yeah. experiment one and two, was the familiarization phase, uh, the actor was actually uh, viewing the objects from, the, the pictures from his perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. So is, is your question here, um, whether toddlers might have seen the actor as taking on their perspective? Sure, because oh, in experiment okay. three, that's the only one in which they're familiarized with the actor yeah, seeing yeah, it from their great, perspective. That's a great question. Okay, so to, um, I will show you data from an experiment I didn't present to get at that. Um, so I've also done this line of work, not just with rabbit duck images, but with human faces. Um, and you might ask, like, did toddlers assume the actor would take on their perspective. So to try to get at that, in a further experiment, we, rather than manipulating the orientation of pictures relative to the actor or to the toddler, we manipulated the visibility of the pictures, trying to get at this idea that past work has demonstrated the sensitivity to perceptual access. Okay, if it's something uniquely difficult about perceptual experience, then toddlers might pass here. If, though, instead toddlers are just assuming that the actor is taking on their perspective, um, like regardless of whether it's experience or access, uh, then we might get the same pattern of findings that I've been showing you. Um, does that make sense? Um, OK. So we have this version where it's visibility instead of experience that we're getting at, um, and the um, the key point that I'm trying to make is that we see the reverse pattern here, uh, suggestive that it is something uniquely difficult about understanding perceptual experience um, above and beyond perceptual access. Uh, there was, there's this question here, yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is related, do you think that um, while infants building some ex expectations about the uh, agent's perspective, do you think that they're also taking a simultaneous perspective of their own? And the second question is about the third experiment. Do you think that if they were also primed about their own perspective, something like I see duck and you see bu uh, bunny, do you think the findings will be the same or differ in a way that, we, again, yeah, like in the case of first experiment? Was yeah. that clear? Um, sorry, could you repeat Again? the second part for a second? The second part oh, is, thank you. I guess you primed uh, with the uh, agent's perspective that I see bunny, mm -hmm. or what will happen if you also at the same time uh, prime for their own perspective, infant's perspective? I, I mean that you see it as rabbit while yeah. I'm seeing it something dark, something like that. Yeah. Do you think that the, the findings will differ? Yeah, okay. Um, so. Uh, 
to your first point, um, I, I think you were, you were asking, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you were asking if um, toddlers were seeing this from their perspective in our experiments. Um, okay, so that's a, great, that's a great question. And so a lot of what I've done so far um, has been to uh, do this all over video calls because a lot of this did occur during the pandemic. Um, and one thing that I think could really like make it or break it for this idea of whether toddlers are being egocentric here um, is a version of these experiments that's not over video calls, but in person. Um, and the reason for that is that I want to do a situation where rather than the actor moving, it's the toddler moving. Um, and so this could help to address like some concerns, like, okay, is it really the toddler's perspective that they are prioritizing? Or it may, might it be even something as low level as like, the orientation of an image relative to the room. Um, and so if it's the toddler moving, we can, I think, go beyond that. Um, to your second point, um, which I think is about using language to maybe prime the toddler's perspective more, um, I, I think that's a great, um, that's a great like, possible direction for future research. And I think the, the third experiment I showed you is just like scratching the surface, the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot more to explore. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. On that note, I think we will have to wrap up, and let's thank Brandon again. Thank you.